Hey friends, welcome to my channel or welcome back. My name is Bailey and this is The Bailey Grind. Usually we talk about books, but today we're going to talk about all of the podcasts I listened to, books I read, documentaries I watched, movies I watched, in June. And that's largely because I've had a horrible month with depression and grief. And my highly functioning depression is um, manifests in a way of like, I fixate on something hardcore. And lucky for us, I fixated on really interesting history this month. So what I'm gonna do that's a little different than my normal videos for a wrap up is I'm gonna start off with the TV shows and documentaries and podcasts I watch and then move into the books. And that's because the books were highly influenced by the other media I was consuming. So if you are only here for the books, feel free to fast forward. I don't know how to do time cards yet, but I will try. Otherwise, you know how YouTube works. So I'm going to get started with a couple TV shows. The first one I started off with was season six of Outlander. If you've been hiding under a rock and you don't know what Outlander is about, it's about a nurse named Claire. I think she's a nurse for the army in World War II. I don't really remember season one, but her and her husband are separated during the war and they're newly married. And so when they have their honeymoon after the war, they end up going to Scotland. And then Claire accidentally time travels. She walks into the middle of a stone circle and touches one and she time travels. And it's back to um, a tumultuous, tumultuous time in Scotland where she meets Jamie. And Jamie ends up being the love of her life, but she's married. So it's this, uh, you don't know who she's gonna pick. She's trying to go back to her time period, but she's also torn because she's madly in love with Jamie. And the whole premise is like, uh, will love conquer time, essentially. And so anyways, yeah, I'm on season six, so obviously I've been enjoying it. I would advise you not to watch it around children or not to watch it on a first date like I did, because it can get kind of awkward especially if you and your date haven't kissed yet. I speak from experience. So season six was really, really lame. I'm looking at my notes because there's a lot to go over today. Season six was really, really lame, but the last two episodes, I was just eating it all up. And that's because it's the beginning of the American Revolution. And also, Claire is once again being um, accused of witchcraft because she's a surgeon and a doctor in her time. I, I Earlier I said nurse, I didn't mean that. I meant surgeon, sorry. And so that was really cool. I almost gave up on it, but I thought about it like a rose bush. And sometimes the rose bush doesn't bloom as much one year but you don't pull it out just because it didn't bloom as much. So I waited for this rose bush to blossom and it did. I would, I would definitely recommend Outlander. The other thing I watched was Tiny Beautiful Things. Um, there's a video I did recently about why you should read Tiny Beautiful Things, listen to Cheryl Strait's podcast and watch the TV show. I sobbed like a baby every episode just sobbed, sobbed, sobbed. And that's because, well, life. <laughs> um, life is extremely beautiful to me. And when people speak passionately about it or people acknowledge the mundane as beautiful, it really resonates with me. Um, and also life is just so fast and, uh, I felt like the TV show largely spoke to that in which every episode is about following your heart. Life's too short not to follow your heart. And 
usually following your heart about something you're extremely passionate following your following your bliss essentially if you don't know what tiny beautiful things is go and watch my youtube video i spent a while trying to figure out how to make everyone read tiny beautiful things but it's essentially cheryl Strayed was an advice columnist known as sugar so people would write in and they'd say dear sugar and they would talk about their life they would ask advice and then she would just very i mean just the most beautiful responses would come from her um very much i would say vulnerable they're very vulnerable and she shares a lot of her anecdotes tiny beautiful things the tv show is largely based off of her she says it's about 50 percent based off of her and that's from an interview i saw um so yeah i won't go more into it but i will just say life is short follow your heart follow your bliss i wish i could do that sometimes you know uh other people have free will so it's difficult but you have to um, also understand that following your bliss and, and love is also loss, which the book and TV show talk about frequently. The other TV show I watched is called The Serpent Queen, and that is on Stars, where you can also find Outlander. I'm really fascinated by the Medicis. I think that they're super underrated in history as far as what we learn in school. Um, I was on my way to getting a, an art history major, and we didn't learn about the Medicis at all, which is very, very strange. So I've taken it onto my own hands to research the Medicis whenever I can. So the Serpent Queen is about Catherine Medici, and she is Italian. She has a horrible, horrible life. She's an orphan. She's you know whatever horrible life and then she becomes the french queen so it's her his her trajectory and all of the people she essentially had to like sabotage to get there so this is her perspective and she's narrating her story to a servant uh so you're kind of getting her her side to things, right? But also knowing that her side of things might not possibly be the truth. It seems like she might be manipulating the servant, I should say. So that was really interesting to me. I've seen a lot of TV shows from the angle of um, other royals that had to be around Catherine Medici and she takes on a very villainous you know, character, trope. And so I liked her perspective in Serpent Queen, but also one of the things that I really liked, I looked up what the showrunner's purpose was in this TV show because it was kind of, there were certain things I wanted to research. One, she let anybody use whatever accents that they already, you know, speak with. And that's because she doesn't agree that old means British accents, right? So. Um, I looked her up and she said that she was really trying to make a TV show that spoke to the royals as humans versus just nobility. Like, they're pretty crazy. They would like throw furniture over balconies trying to hit people and like people died from that. Like nobles died from, from that game. So I liked the TV show a lot. I also was really fascinated that people used to drink gold and that was because they were trying to reverse age like we still do crazy things to look younger but they would drink gold i i didn't believe that so i looked it up and it's true and a lot of people went crazy and died from drinking gold so don't do it if you can get your hands on gold it's really expensive but just don't do it so now I'll tell you about documentaries. I watched Meet the Romans with Mary Beard. So this is a three-part series originally on air through BBC, but I found it for free on YouTube. I will show it down here below. 
I really, I love Mary Beard, of course. And I also read one of her books this month, so stay tuned for that. But um, I found that in this series, she was really interested in everyday life for citizens. And a lot of her research for this series was looking at like gravestones, which was really fascinating. So I don't know what else to say about this besides Mary Beard is awesome. Learning about the Romans through Mary Beard's perspective is awesome. I will say she is just the epitome of a British old woman. That's, I mean, she's very liberal for being a British old woman. Um, but there were moments where her sense of humor was like jarring. Like, did she just say that? So it was entertaining. The next uh, documentary I saw, link down below, is my favorite, Bethany Hughes. And it was, why did the ancient Minoans worship the Minotaur? And although there wasn't much conversation around the Minotaur in this documentary, which I found, I thought that would be the central, central focus, but it was not. It was mainly the history of the Minoans, which is fascinating in itself. I always thought of the Minoans more as an extension of Greece, but that's not true. The Minoans were more of an extension of Egypt. So yeah, it was interesting. I love all of Benny Hughes' documentaries, and this one is free. It's from the Odyssey, as you'll see below. Okay, now moving on to the YouTube videos I watched because they were classes, kind of like lectures. So the first one was Jackson Crawford's free class on runes. Now Jackson Crawford used to be a professor. His YouTube channel actually says he's a real expertise in Norse language and myth, free of both ivory tower elitism and the agendas of self-appointed gurus, which is hilarious. I love, I love that about section. I can't wait to have an about section similar. Um, so if you use runes for divination, or if you think that's the history of them, you might not enjoy finding out the academic history of runes. Um, they're more just like an alphabet. And so it was a fascinating series. I definitely think that you should watch it. It did um, change the way I looked at runes and I'm not sure I wanted to change the way I looked at runes. <laughs> I really, uh, I really kind of wanted to believe that runes were more than just letters, but they're not. So anyways, Jackson Crawford's channel is amazing. I've been subscribed to him for a while. And uh, he he goes about the Norse history and mythology in the most objective manner possible, right? So he's not wanting to be like a modern day Viking, right? So if you wanna know anything about Norse anything, go and check Jackson Crawford out. Then I listen to podcasts, and I mainly listen to The Ancients this month, which is just the best podcast ever. It is, I think it's owned by History Hit TV, or an extension of, I don't remember. But the first podcast episode I listened to was about the Picts, and it's called The Picts Scourge of Rome. What's really interesting, so the Picts were actually Scottish, um, like indigenous, indigenous Scots and they were so scary that Hadrian's wall was built to keep them away from the Romans and there is now archaeological evidence for their existence which is largely what this podcast was about the scholar that was being interviewed was told to not try and get his doctorate studying the pics just leave them alone because there's nothing out there and thankfully, during his lifetime and his studies, they have uncovered archaeological evidence. So he's stoked, obviously, and it was a really, really interesting podcast. And the other podcast I listened to was about Lilith, and it's called Lilith Mesopotamian Demoness. 
a scholar was interviewed for this podcast. She wrote a book, it's called Women's Lore, I believe, and it's about women demons in history, dark goddesses, if you will. And so what she was talking about largely was the archeological evidence for Lilith and how Lilith kind of transitioned. It was very pre-Christian Lilith, the pre-Christian understanding or pre even Abrahamic religions. Lilith was prayed to when women were in labor um, because the belief was that Lilith did not allow Adam in the garden to dominate her. She wanted to be on top during, you know, the biblical getting to know one another kind of thing. For that, she was expelled from the garden. She, I think she actually ran away. I can't remember, but whatever. She left the garden. Poor Eve. So she spent the rest of her life taking babies away from moms, sometimes during labor, sometimes right afterwards. Now, obviously I don't enjoy that depiction of Lilith because I have seen what women throughout history have been portrayed as, and I'm sure if Lilith was a real human being one day, it would have been way more nuanced than that. However, I do have this like weird relationship with that Lilith right now because I am biologically like the the need to have a child is really kicking in right now and I can't even look at mothers at the moment. I'm just filled with like envy and so I wonder if sometimes you know myths come from those like real emotions and so yeah I'm thinking a lot about Lilith in terms of being the independent woman who also loses some things that she might have actually really wanted if that makes sense. The third podcast I listened to was called Boudicca's Battle of Britain and Boudicca was the Celtic warrior queen who almost defeated the Romans. Um, she did kill many, many Romans, but it was originally thought of as a tale, right? It's like this hero's journey, con almost conquering the biggest monster in the world type thing. But the scholar that was being interviewed was talking about how there's archeological evidence being uncovered at certain sites in Britain um, where the locations might have been the ones that were described in the tale of Boudicca, if that makes any sense. So it's possible she did exist. It's possible she wasn't just this like folkloric heroine. So I thought that was really neat, especially because I love Boudicca as you will see in the books that I discuss. And I hope that she did exist because uh, yeah, that's badass. Lastly, I watched, I'm back on my daily stoicism bullshit. So the daily stoic Ryan Holiday really, really helps me when I'm feeling depressed or anxious. I will link his videos down below. But yeah, I'm re-watching mainly like all of his YouTube videos at the moment. I do practice his note-taking techniques, which unfortunately this month my hand is going to be killing me. Um, one of the things that he does is any quotes from books after you've like let them sit for a little bit, any quotes or conversations that you had with the book, you write down on note cards and then you basically create your own like commonplace book system. So that's what I do. And uh, yeah, he's motivational. I like that he keeps it real. He gives you great tips. He talks about, you know, leadership and compassion. The list goes on. So go and check his channel out. Now we're getting into books. So the first book I finished 
this month was Mistborn by Brandon Sanderson. This is actually The Final Empire is what the book is called in the Mistborn series. And so it is fantasy, just be advised. And it's a chunky book. It doesn't, it doesn't really look like it, but this alone was 500 pages. I hate this cover. I tried to find this size book without this cover because there's multiple covers and I'm not sure why this cover is chosen, but be beyond that we're following Vin, who lives in this world, and she is an orphan who, she basically lives with all of these thieves, but there's something that's a little different about her in that she can kind of change how people feel. She can kind of alter their emotions, but she doesn't really know how or why doesn't really look into it. She doesn't have any guidance, right? And so she's in this world where her kind is oppressed. They're basically slaves to this um, god. Wow, how am I going to describe this book? It's really complex. So there's the hero's journey of Vin. And she's been discovered by... God, what is his name? Kelsier. Yes. She's been discovered by a guy who is a Mistborn, and Mistborns are super rare. They're magical beings, essentially, where they can ingest metals and then utilize the metals to do magical things. <laughs> it sounds crazy. It sounds crazy, but it's really complex. If you're not, if you're not a big fantasy lover, I think you should give it a shot. It's a very, very, very different world that Brandon Sanderson has created. It's not like the medieval Tolkien inspired magic system at all. It's a completely different magic system that uses metals. Um, so we've got the hero's journey. We've got a completely different magic system. We have court intrigue. We have politics. We have a romance subplot. I mean, it's just, there's like a Gandalf Dumbledore type character. We have these people trying to defeat a god who's a horrible leader. It's got a lot. So I would have given this book five stars. However, I dropped it down to four because the first 200 pages were a slog. They were really hard for me to get through. That's mainly because this is a series, right? So Brandon Sanderson has to introduce a lot of these complex, like the complex magic system or the relationships or the characters. And uh, yeah, I wasn't really connecting to anything until about page 200, where Vin meets someone special and then sparks a romance. And so of course that's gonna get me intrigued. I would definitely continue on with the series and recommend it. So put it on your list. The other book I finished this month was The Maidens, which I have a whole vlog about. Please check it out. It's the thriller's vlog. It's by Alex Michael Ides, and this is following a woman who is a psychotherapist, a group psychotherapist. Her niece, who she essentially adopted, is um, at university and her friends are disappearing. And so the main character is also grieving for her husband who died tragically and so she goes to see her niece and just be present but she also thinks that it's a professor of classics who is murdering these these girls and so she's like looking at the group dynamics and she's trying to figure the murder mystery out basically on her own while she's grieving for her husband and there's a lot of allusions to mythology. It's a very dark academia book. If you want to know more, check out my vlog. I gave it five stars. I loved it. A lot of people hate it. I loved it. The other book I read was The Sundown Motel by Simone St. James. This is also in the thriller vlog. It's a very, very hyped book. I did not find it to be a thriller. I found it to be a really campy ghost story and I DNF'd it but I read enough to consider it read. 
I gave it two stars just because effort. It's really, I really don't get one star very often. I did this month for another book, but we'll see. The other book I read was Lock Every Door by Riley Sager. I've never read Riley Sager before. He's a thriller novelist. And this one was way, way, way too similar to Rosemary's Baby and not even remotely cool enough. Like the atmosphere sucked. The main character was sort of relatable in that she's a broke millennial who just went through a breakup. Um, but beyond that, I knew what was going to happen. I was not connected enough. If you want a thriller that has that takes place in a weird apartment building in New York where there might be some demon shit going on, check out Rosemary's Baby. The other book I read, now this is the one star, the other book I read was Wool Gathering by Patti Smith. I mean, what can I say? I actually sold all of my Patti Smith books. People give me Patti Smith regularly, actually. People think that I am, I reek of Patti Smith. I don't know. I don't know why. I don't know if I should be like offended because I really can't stand Patti Smith's writing. I know a lot of people might unsubscribe now, but Wool Gathering was, it, it read as though Patti Smith just wants to be known as an elite writer. She wants to be, um, it, it had no heart at all. It didn't make any sense. You know when people write poetry and you read it and you're like, what the fuck just happened? What did I just read? That was Wool Gathering. One star. Horrible. Horrible. The other book I read this month was Love in Other Words by Christina Lauren. Christina Lauren. Now those are two names because it's friends who write together. Christina Lauren. This was going to be for a vlog in which I read Book Talk's favorite romance novels. That's not going to happen because Book Talk's favorite romance novels are not my thing. Love in Other Words was okay. It is touted as these two kids who love books and words um, meet each other and connect over, over reading. It's a split timeline, so they're adults now. They've just bumped into each other, and you know that they used to be close as kids, but you don't know what happened. And so you're following them, like reconnecting today, and also following them as kids. And then you get to the climax moment of when like devastation happens. I don't know, I don't remember their names. I don't really remember most of the plot. The climax that happened was super strange in that... Okay, this is a spoiler. Fast forward. Are you fa Did you fast forward if you don't want, don't want to know this? Okay, the dude, they start dating when they're teens, right? Okay, so the dude gets drunk one night on New Year's Eve. And the main, the main chick shows up to the New Year's Eve party and he is cheating on her. And she runs away and calls her dad and her dad ends up dying in a car crash on his way to her. No, on his way back with them both in the car. Then they don't talk for years. And so when they get back together and they decide like, and they start talking about what happened. He says that when he was drunk, he thought that the chick he was hooking up with was her. Have any of you been drunk before and hallucinated a completely different person? I've been drunk many, 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 many times. Never did that. So that was super strange, whatever. There were a couple smutty scenes, but not enough to to sustain me and also the smutty scenes were when, when they were teenagers and that felt very strange to me to read about. Okay, 
moving on. The next book I read was called Women in Power, A Manifesto by Mary Beard. This is very small. It is largely just a manifesto. And it is about how women could not rise to a position of power during the times of the ancient Romans and how that influences women in power today. But she focuses specifically on speech and the history of speech and what makes a good speech and what makes a um, articulate person. And, you know, women were kept literally silent because they were not allowed to speak in public. So she relates that a lot with like Hillary Clinton and women of power today who are made fun of for speeches or the way they talk or I don't know it's pretty complex right like this is a culmination of a lifetime of Mary Beard's research so if you're interested in that at all check it out I give it four stars as opposed to five and that's just because I wanted more and I don't even know if that's fair. I don't know if that's a fair rating. But anyways, okay. The other book I read was Gone Girl by Gillian Flynn. Again, that's on my thrillers blog. I gave it two stars. I gave it two stars because the book is so popular that I knew, I knew what happened to the woman. So it's following a married couple and they hate each other and it's a domestic thriller and you get both perspectives so it's like split perspectives and split timeline the woman goes the wife goes missing and so you're following her husband as he talks to detectives police news yada yada but the woman loved scavenger hunts and so that's something that she did for him every year. I think they're married for five years. But every year for their anniversary, she would make these scavenger hunts. And he hated them. She got really annoyed that he didn't really like understand her or um, the hints, whatever. That they, they just didn't think that they loved one another. It honestly makes marriage look very, very bleak. I know that obviously not all marriages are like this, but oof, it was rough. Um, and then, so I thought that the climax would happen kind of towards the end, like a thriller, you know, unravels and you find out what happens to the person that's missing. But you find out what happens to the person that's missing halfway through the book. And so I kept with it. I'm like, there's no way. There has to be some type of twist. There has to be some, something that nobody has talked about. Like, why would this happen halfway? It just spoils it. And nope, there were no further twists. I was super disappointed in this book. I really wanted to like Gillian Flynn. I really, really, really wanted to. I might continue with some of her other books, but for now, this is two stars. People are obsessed with this book, especially people that love thrillers. So if you're in, if you are on the fence, go ahead and try reading it. The audiobook is really good. So that's all I got to say. The next book I read was Antigone Rising, The Sub Subversive Power of the Ancient Myths by Helen Morales. Helen is an academic. She is professor of classical studies. And so this is mainly talking about how myths affect modern day situations. Um, she's focused on her daughter. Her daughter, I believe, is in like junior high at this point. And so she's focused on some of the things that her daughter is going through. So it's like dress codes. What's the history of dress codes? Is that in mythology at all? Um, she talks about the mythology of Beyonce. So if you like Beyonce, that might be interesting. I skipped actually a lot of her, I skipped a lot of her essays. Um, she talks about the Me Too movement. I do think that all in all, Helen Morales is a really interesting person. I wouldn't recommend this book, especially if you're not interested in mythology. I gave it three stars. 
I'm gonna use a lot of what she says in her like introduction and what she says in her lectures for my graduate school project but beyond that eh, it was okay it's just all right the cover sucks it just does not my thing the next book i read was a dnf and it was for the romance book vlog it's called it ends with us by colleen hoover this is my first colleen hoover book she is almost as popular as i don't know What's her face? Nora Roberts. She's almost as popular as Nora Roberts, if not more. Um, this is following a main character who, this is another thing about these like book talk romance books before I get going, is that they're so flippin' depressing. So this is following a main character who, um, her dad just died. She gave a horrible eulogy and then ran out of the funeral. She's on this rooftop and she meets this, sed you know, seductive boy. Yeah, they start kicking it off, but it's like a another dual timeline thing where she's she's going through her journals in her room one day, while she's having this romance with this guy. And she realizes, oh crap, I used to be in love with this other guy. And so she's reading her journal entries, and they're all addressed to. Ellen, Ellen DeGeneres, because she loves Ellen DeGeneres, which is also like really weird. So they're addressed to her and she's reading them and the, the boy that she used to be in love with was a homeless boy that lived in the house, the abandoned house behind her growing up. And so meanwhile, she's getting like abused by her dad and you know that he did something to the boy. And now she's having this romance with this other, this other man. And she's opening up a book. It's, it's kind of chaotic, to be completely honest. But it was really, really difficult for me to read because she's in her early 20s and she's um, ignoring the red flags of this, of this dude. And it reminded me a lot of myself. And I don't want to read about the chaos that was my early 20s and late 20s to be to be honest. He reminded me a lot of this guy I dated and it was not romantic at all. I hated it. I gave it one star, but the average rating is 4.24 stars on Goodreads. So if you're interested, you might love it. I hated it. All right. The next book is The Norse Queen. It's part of a series called The Norse Women and it's by Joanna Wittenberg. I saw this I saw Joanna Wittenberg in an interview and I was really intrigued. I wanted to read whatever she wrote because she seemed like a really cool woman. I gave this book four stars and that's because, okay, hear me out. The Norse Queen is about Osa, who was a historical figure. She was a Norse Queen. Um, there's not much that's been said about Osa. Of course, like she's a woman, so history isn't history isn't written from a woman's perspective really but it's kind of like a Tristan and Isolde type story where this other king this other Norse king wants to marry Osa when she's like a princess and she says no and so he uh slaughters everyone she's ever loved raids raids her town and abducts her but she falls in love with her with his son yeah you can definitely see how it would be a complex story if i say anything else it'll just give spoilers but joanna wittenberg really 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 understands the history surrounding this like she's her research in this novel is spot on and so yes that's that's amazing but at the same time it it does read as though an academic wrote a historical fiction novel. So you're not going to get the inner dialogue that you might get from characters. It's not really fluffy by any means. But if you want to read historical fiction about a Norse figure, this would be the way to go because the research is just amazing. Joanna Wittenberg said in an interview that there were fantasy elements to this book and she was a little nervous that people 
wouldn't enjoy that part. But I would argue that fantasy, again, was not... We separate fantasy, we separate fiction, nonfiction, fantasy. This is like, this is actually new. It's a new thing for societies to do. Um, so it was very much a belief that trees had spirits. You know, it was very much a belief that the ship had spirits or if the weather was doing something, it was because it was a message from the gods. And so I didn't really feel as though this was a fantasy novel. It had fantasy elements, but I thought she did an amazing job. Sorry, that was in defense. Like, if you don't like fantasy, I think you would still like this book. Um, again, the four stars was because of the lack of inner dialogue, the lack of like really connecting with the characters, but I love reading about the culture. I love reading about um, the atmosphere and, and the plot. So I would continue on with the series. The next book I read was actually Pride and Prejudice by Jane Austen. That was a reread and that's for Jane Austen July. Check out my Jane Austen July TBR video. And I'm going to save how I feel about that for next month. Another book I read this month was The Power of Myth by Joseph Campbell. This was my third reread. This is the book. And Joseph Campbell is my hmm, idol. I love Joseph Campbell. I love the way that he thinks. Um, sometimes when he writes, I actually get teary-eyed because academia hates the way that people like Joseph Campbell think. Really, truly. Um, he is what they would call a generalist. So he ties in all of these different things. You can't like just stick him into the religious studies department or stick him into the history department because he sees how mythology influences every department and discipline, right? So he gives me a lot of hope for myself, but also, okay, look at this. And it sucks because I have to rewrite all of this. I love everything that Joseph Campbell has to say. So The Power of Myth is an interview. It's the transcript of an interview with Bill Moyers. If you don't have time to read, you can check out the interview. I think it might be on Amazon and not for free, but check it out. One of the things that I will say is that people often talk to me about this book as though it's going to cover like Greek and Roman, you know, the pantheons. Not true. It's about mythology in the Bible, mythology in folklore, the importance of returning to mythology, why, why Bill Moyers and Joseph Campbell see issues today as stemming from the lack of mythology. So the, the table of contents, it goes over the myth in the modern world, the journey inward, the first storytellers, sacrifice and bliss, the hero's adventure, the gift of the goddess, tales of love and marriage, and mass of eternity. The tales of love and marriage was always my least favorite section, and this time it was a little different just because I studied the Arthurian legends. Um, was it over this winter that I did a lot of research into the Arthurian legends? And this is largely about knighthood and troubadours. Um, one of the things that I really liked was that uh, there was this kind of like, although this interview happened in the 80s, I believe. Sorry, I'm all over the place. Yep. There was this like esotericism almost in talking about love and how sometimes when you're married or you're with someone, you find the love of your life. And how that story is like Tristan and he's old, right? And it's about this acknowledgement of the other soul and how essentially it's the acknowledgement of your soul because that's who the other person is. It's your, your soul split into two and that's like the grand journey of love and life and if you believe all of that, right? Um, so that really resonated with me because that's my own experience as well with love. And also speaks to the fact that back 
in the time of like knights and troubadours, people were marry marrying for status, for wealth, for stability, for um, everything but love. The timing was right, whatever. And I often see that today as still happening. Um, you know, you're stuck in a small town. This person is nice. You want to have children. Okay, let's do it. And then later on, you have like this midlife crisis of sorts because you fell in love. And if your story was like Tristan and he's old, they would say that you drank a potion, right? But our lives haven't changed so much is what I'm getting at. So I would definitely advise reading The Power of Myth. If you're not familiar with Joseph Campbell, start here. This is a lot about his other studies, like um, A Hero with a Thousand Faces. He discusses that a lot in this book. Um, the Goddess, he also has a whole book on the Arthurian legends, so he goes over that a bit, like I just said. Yeah, what else can I say? I'm a huge fan, five stars. Okay, y'all, if you've made it this far, thanks for bearing with me. The last book I read this month is Dreaming the Eagle, Boudicca by Amanda Scott. This was highly suggested on the Brothers Gwyn, their YouTube channel. They're always talking about this book. Now, what I will say is that they also love Cormac McCarthy. I bring that up because this book is very, very depressing, <laughs> to say the least. So if you know the story of Boudicca, right? the Celtic warrior queen, almost defeated the Romans, like I said earlier. However, you'll know how it ends. And this, so that's like looming in the background, is that you're going to have to say goodbye to a lot of the people that you're falling in love with in the book. But that's to Amanda Scott's credit, because Amanda Scott really makes you care about not only the humans, but also the animals so much. So if you remember, this was actually, I DNF'd this maybe back in January or February because I just could not handle the animal abuse. There is some animal abuse at the, at the beginning. Um, Amanda Scott was a vet before she started her writing career. And so you can really tell like it's the smallest details like um when the horses ride off to war and they have bits in their mouth and there's like foaming blood like the very smallest details she'll describe but if you think those are small details just imagine what the bigger details are if you've ever like seen a battle scene on tv in a movie and you wonder what happened to all the horses what happened to all of the dogs well, she'll tell you She'll tell you what happens. So take it for what it is. But this is following Boudicca and her half-brother Vaughn, I believe is how you she wants you to pronounce like the Gaelic name. It's very much of like, this is a world full of warriors and dreamers and small communities. And the small communities war are warring against one another, but they're also, some of them are siding with the Romans. And this is post the first invasion of the Romans. And this is more of like the Caligula's time period. This book is. So you know that doom is on the horizon. And so you're like, I don't know. This was one of the most stressful books I think I've ever read. Besides The Golden Compass. <laughs> I think that this was really stressful. So when I read Pride and Prejudice, I just relaxed and I didn't realize I was in such this like animal stress mode because of reading this book. But I'm giving it five stars. The writing is beautiful. The characters are super, you connect to all of the characters. Um, the descriptions of herbs even were like, the plants, the smells, the, you're just fully immersed in this book. It's awesome. 
if you don't care about doom and gloom and you're okay with it feel free like pick this book up if you're not okay with it still pick this book up and see what your threshold is for me as a vegetarian animal rights crazy activist um i would i was having a really really hard time with this book so i might not continue the series but again that is to manda scott's credit right so like i might not continue this because i'm depressed enough but but that's to her credit because she's connecting you to the characters you're getting these visceral emotions from these connections and yeah that's a great writer that makes a great writer thanks for sticking it out with me this next month i'm moving moving in with my mom and i am battling depression and anxiety so i will be partaking in jane austen in july but that this is probably the last you'll see of me for four weeks until i do a wrap up of july books so make sure you subscribe so that you know when i come back don't forget about me i'm still here you can still always like reach out to me i am on youtube every day because youtube is better than netflix so yeah stay stay friends with me stay tuned i hope to see y'all soon